Synopsis of the Books of the Bible. Mark. By J. N. Darby. New Testament. The Gospel of Mark. Chapter 7. The Heart of Man and the Heart of God. The ruling power in exercise among the Jews had shown itself hostile to the testimony of God and had put to death the one whom he had sent in the way of righteousness. The scribes and those who pretended to follow righteousness had corrupted the people by their teaching and had broken the law of God. They washed cups and pots, but not their hearts, and, provided that the priests, religion, gained by it, set aside the duties of children to their parents. But God looked at the heart, and from the heart of man proceeded every kind of impurity, iniquity, and violence. It was that which defiled the man, not having his hands unwashed. Such is the judgment on religiousness without conscience and without fear of God, and the true discernment of what the heart of man is in the sight of God, who is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. But God must also show his own heart, and if Jesus judged that of man with the eye of God, if he manifested his ways and his faithfulness to Israel, he displayed nevertheless through it all, what God was to those who felt their need of him and came to him in faith, owning and resting upon his pure goodness. From the land of Tyre and Sidon comes a woman of the condemned race, a Gentile and a Syrophoenician. The Lord replies to her, on her request that he would heal her daughter, that the children, the Jews, must first be filled, that it was not right to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs, an overwhelming answer, if the sense she had of her need and of the goodness of God had not gone beyond, and set aside, every other thought. These two things made her humble of heart, and ready to own the sovereign favor of God towards the people of his choice in this world. Had he not a right to choose a people? And she was not one of them. But that did not destroy his goodness and his love. She was but a Gentile dog, yet such was the goodness of God that he had bred even for dogs. Christ, the perfect expression of God, the manifestation of God himself in the flesh, could not deny his goodness and his grace, could not say that faith had higher thoughts of God than were true, for he was himself that love. The sovereignty of God was acknowledged, no pretension made to any right whatsoever. The poor woman rested only upon grace. Her faith, with an intelligence given of God, laid hold of the grace which went beyond the promises made to Israel. She penetrates into the heart of the God of love, as he is revealed in Jesus, even as he penetrates into ours, and she enjoys the fruit of it. For this was brought in now, God himself directly in presence of and connection with man, and man as he was before God, not a rule or system for man to prepare himself for God. Hearing and speech bestowed in grace, apart from the multitude. In the next miracle, we see the Lord, by the same grace, bestowing hearing and speech upon the man who was deaf and unable even to express his thoughts. He could have received no fruit from the word, from God, and could give no praise to him. The Lord is returned into the place where he arose as light on Israel, and here he deals with the remnant alone. He takes the man apart from the multitude. It is the same grace that takes the place of all pretensions to righteousness in man, and that manifests itself to the destitute. Its form, though exercised now in favor of the remnant of Israel, is suited to the condition of Jew or Gentile, it is grace. But as to these two it is the same, he takes the man apart from the crowd, that the work of God may be wrought, the crowd of this world had no real part therein. We see Jesus here, his heart moved at the condition of man and more especially at the state of his ever-loved Israel, of which this poor sufferer was a striking picture. He causes the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. So was it individually, and so will it be with the whole remnant of Israel in the latter days. He acts himself, and he does all things well. The power of the enemy is destroyed, the man's deafness, his inability to use his tongue as God gave it to him, are taken away by his love who acts with the power of God. The miracle of the loaves bore witness to the presence of the God of Israel, according to his promises, this, to the grace that went beyond the limits of these promises, on the part of God, who judged the condition of those who asserted a claim to them according to righteousness, and that of man, evil in himself, and who delivered man and blessed him in love, withdrawing him from the power of Satan, and enabling him to hear the voice of God, and to praise him. Hidden from the Jews in rejection, need met in grace and power by the one who alone can supply it. 
there are yet some remarkable features in this part of the history of Christ, which I desire to point out. They manifest the spirit in which Jesus labored at this moment. He departs from the Jews, having shown the emptiness and hypocrisy of their worship, and the iniquity of every human heart as a source of corruption and sin. The Lord, at this solemn moment, which displayed the rejection of Israel, goes far away from the people to a place where there was no opportunity for service among them, to the borders of the stranger and Canaanite cities of Tyre and Sidon, Mark 7 verse 24, and, his heart oppressed, would have no one knows where he was. But God had been too plainly manifested in his goodness and his power, to allow him to be hidden whenever there was need. The report of what he was had gone abroad, and the quick eye of faith discovered that which alone could meet its need. It is this that finds Jesus, when all, that had outwardly a right to the promises, are deceived by this pretension itself and by their privileges. Faith it is that knows its need and knows that only, and that Jesus alone can meet it. That which God is to faith is manifested to the one that needs it, according to the grace and power that are in Jesus. Hidden from the Jews, he is grace to the sinner. Thus, also, Mark 7 verse 33, when he heals the deaf man of his deafness and of the impediment in his speech, he takes him aside from the multitude, and looks up to heaven and sighs. Oppressed in his heart by the unbelief of the people, he takes the object of the exercise of his power aside looks up to the sovereign source of all goodness, of all help for man, and grieves at the thought of the condition in which man is found. This case then exemplifies more particularly, the remnant according to the election of grace from among the Jews, who are separated by divine grace from the mass of the nation, faith, in these few, being in exercise. The heart of Christ is far from repulsing his, earthly, people. His soul is overwhelmed by the sense of the unbelief that separates them from him and from deliverance, nevertheless, he takes away from some the deaf heart, and loses their tongue, in order that the God of Israel may be glorified. Thus also on the death of Lazarus, Christ grieves at the sorrow which death brings upon the heart of man. There, however, it was a public testimony. Faith not forsaken, but power not exercised where there is manifest unbelief. We shall find in Mark 8 another example of that which we have been noticing. Jesus leads the blind man out of the town. He does not forsake Israel wherever there is faith, but he separates the one who possesses it from the mass, and brings him into connection with the power, the grace, the heaven, whence blessing flowed, blessing consequently which extended to the Gentiles. Power was not exercised in the midst of manifest unbelief. This clearly marks out the position of Christ with regard to the people. He pursues his service, but he retires to God because of Israel's unbelief, but it is to the God of all grace. There his heart found refuge till the great hour of atonement, 